the last time that we spoke was five years ago, and a lot of things have happened uh, in that uh, time. Uh, not just not just that you released uh, uh, an album, uh, but also that there was a little bit of a pandemic uh, that we're still uh, yeah. uh, going through. And I wanted to know just how did you spend this very challenging time? This is really unfortunate for many, many, but for me, this was the right time to have any such thing happening because I, I've been aching for a break for a long, long time. For years and years already that I, I because for me the life in some of the arctic guys writing songs going to the studio recording the album finishing it then interviews releasing the album going on tour and repeat and if i want to have like a couple of weeks or, or whatever month off i i really can't have that because I, you know i'm a i'm creating things i need to create things all the time and if i get an idea i need to put it down somewhere so i'm, I'm basically working 24 7 and, and and it just never goes anywhere and, and this has allowed me to kind of let a lot of strings go for a while and and, and it's been a healthy break for me and uh, and we were really lucky also i have to say financially because we we were lucky to be able to tour all the main uh, market areas before the whole thing was shut down with with w album and and so and unlike unfortunately like nightwish for example they released an album and then nothing we were really really fortunate and lucky with that and and, and now i feel I'm, I'm i'm done with my break and i would be really happy to start doing things and of course you know we've been we've been doing stuff as well preparing for the future i've been writing songs i have another side project that i will maybe talk about later sometime when it's 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 out <laughs> and uh th this is this has been really really good break for a lot of us especially us who have kids at home because they are of that age that it actually makes a little bit difference whether dad is home or not like myself i have like lower elementary school aged kids so so it, it dad is a is a big thing to have at home still unlike 10 years from now if they live still live here how how old are your kids they are under 10 both of them so they're they're very very young and and they were born after your success in sonata Artica. then how has that changed for you because uh, i've spoken with for example you mentioned night which i've spoken about this with uh marco yetala when he was still in in sonata precisely about this issue of being a musician in his case with with a very large following um uh, but at the same time, be seen as, I don't know, that's just dad, <laughs> you know, like just the dude who, yeah. who does the laundry, etc. cetera. Um, uh, you continue to be a touring musician. And in fact, next year, you know, <laughs> all going well, uh, you're yeah. going to be touring a lot. You're going to be in South America even. How has that experience of, on the one hand, being an idol for a lot of people, while at the same time having this connection to earth uh, with with your children uh, and on the other knowing that you will spend long periods of time sadly away from them when the kids were born it was a major change of priorities in life <laughs> obviously it sh it must be it should be for everybody you know kids kids come first but uh, unfortunately then you know touring wise that's not an option we need to go out there to make a living and 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 and, and such thing but that's the same thing I, I consider us in in a way in the same same position as like oil rig workers in a way that we need to be away from home for a certain period of time and then we get to stay stay home for a while and, and then the whole thing goes again it's like we are basically told to go in a place and, and do our work and then come back home and uh, but uh, of course it's not quite as black and white as, as it sounds here. How do they react to see that their dad is famous? In a way, I think the older one is, is getting hang of it a little bit. You know, he's, he's been asking questions about it. Why do strangers call you and want to talk to you for an hour? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, that's one thing. But then, you know, why suddenly some stranger comes and asks for an autograph in a store uh, and, and such things that are like far from the normal. And uh, it's it's still weird for them and I, I think they are yet to kind of comprehend the whole magnitude of the things that dad is known and you can see him on tv and and hear him on radio and a sort of known figure in the local area at least i think that will get a little bit 
worse, I fear, <laughs> when they get a little older and go into upper elementary school and so forth, because that's when, when kids start to pay attention to such things much more than they do at that age that they are now. It's going to be weird, but we need to be prepared and, and, and they need to understand that I'm, I'm just a normal guy doing that stuff and I just have a weird job. That's that's about it. Several bands, yours uh, included, uh, have done some live streamed concerts. Um, last year you did actually one. That's the first time you yeah. did the Acoustic Adventures 2020. Uh, and now these Acoustic Adventures are coming out as an album. Yes, um, yes. Tell me a little bit about why you wanted to do something like this. Uh, started uh, Sonata Arica started, in a way, uh, as, a, as a power metal band. So obviously, I know that you said it's more melodic metal, but at the very least, let's say, a fast metal, regardless of what specific genre we talk about. Yeah. So obviously, your audience feels an attraction to that kind of speed. Um, but at the same time, you're abandoning this for an acoustic adventure. Now, I know that you've done this before. In fact, on YouTube, I found, I was very surprised to see that uh, over 10 years ago, you were already doing covers of one of my favorite songs, My Land. Why did you want to slow down a little bit, both in the concert as well as in the album, to create something uh, acoustic? The whole spark started, I think, sometime really, really early, I think, around the time when we released Silence or whatever, we had, as a bonus track, we had acoustic version of Mary Lou. And it felt really natural because it gave a song that we really liked a different mood and atmosphere and feel to it. And uh, it gives the song a second life that they can live like parallel to each other somehow. And then we uh, already with Live in Finland's DVD, we had this acoustic moment there and which we also did on tour when we had a chance we took our acoustic guitars and played a few songs acoustically so the spark has been there brewing for for quite a while and now now when we uh, embarked this tour the first acoustic adventures tour uh, the idea came upon that that we actually could make an album out of this and and the label was like oh yeah yeah, yeah this actually works really well all by they were pretty uh, hesitant and, and, and suspicious that whether or not it would actually appeal to the people because at that point they didn't understand and, and know that we had have actually rearranged the songs completely and sometimes even, you know, recomposed some bits and pieces there. So they are not just, you know, straight playthrough of the original version with acoustic instruments because that's like going where the fence is the lowest and <laughs> so it's the easiest way and then and I feel the wrong way to do at least with our music they they were like oh right yeah, let's do this and let's make two albums because you seem to have a lot of material already on, on the live shows there and that's how it came to be so it's been bubbling under for many many years 20 years I think since you've already had this uh, opportunity to do this type of music live both on tour as well as in last year's uh, acoustic adventures uh stream how was the reaction that you received uh, from that? I am sure that you've heard or seen comments from, from fans about how they perceived this uh, acoustic adventure. Uh, you mean the, the stream? The stream, correct. They were like very, very positive. It, people seemed to like it. And uh, the weirdest and, and the, the only negative thing that I, what I heard, someone said that it was a recorded show, the second one that was recorded in the middle of the night because you had like sun shining there and everything. It can't be middle of the night. <laughs> yeah, hello. Well, welcome to Finland in the middle of summer, you know, because <laughs> the sun does not set at all. We have daylight like 24 or 7. So, <laughs> so for a lot of people, I think, or at least some of them there, it, that was the first touch of the midnight sun that we have here during the summer so people started thinking that we, we have actually pre-recorded the show and it's just broadcasting it but no we were actually awake trying to survive the show you know in the middle of the night and it, it was it was pretty painful and i was so tired but you know it was fun regardless a few years ago i remember that you made this re-recording of uh, ecliptica and when we talked about it, you mentioned that that album was more of a request from a label 
uh, that then got yes. said requested by the European label because originally the the Japanese one wanted to release it, and then the European says, "Hey, how about we do this as well?" Uh, in the case of Acoustic Adventures, uh, I'm I'm guessing based on what you're describing, as well as by the fact that they, this is only part one, that this isn't like that. That this is really something that the band wanted to create as a musical uh, expression. Yes, this was. This started with us. We requested and asked, that, could we please do something like this? And this is something that we really, really want to do. Touring and playing these songs acoustically is the most fun I can think of, really, in music. Because, you know, as much as I love the more heavy metal shows, this gives me space to kind of express myself as a singer so much more than the cramped heavy metal shows which are really breathtaking sometimes. And then now you can interact with people even during the song because it's, the volume is not so deafening. It's just more, so much more intimate, the whole thing. that it, it's, I, I love it. One idea also, obviously, with these albums was to kind of use these as a marketing tool. So we might hopefully be one day able to take this whole thing, not only in mainland Europe, but, but also maybe in North America and South America. That would be really great and a lot of fun. And this is, you know, Acoustic Adventures uh, Part 1. At the same time, you mentioned that you're already writing uh, music uh, for other albums and that you've actually used the time during this uh, atrocious pandemic to do some writing. So what would be the follow-up to this? Because Acoustic Adventures Part 1, for those who are not familiar with it, is, is a cover album of your own music. You're rearranging Sonata's Artica's own music. Yeah. Uh, so what would the next step be? The next proper Sonata Artica? I, I don't mean proper in a condescending way. The next proper album or, or the next uh, Acoustic uh, Adventures? We already actually recorded this volume one and volume two both of them a year ago they were supposed to be at this date i think the volume two should already be out had there not been this pandemic thing but everything was postponed by a year so uh so there's going to be a second one obviously and 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 i hope third as well but that's something that we have not even discussed yet and, and so the plan is to 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 create both acoustic adventures together so in the sense you'll release the first one then the second one then another studio album yeah the next like 11th sonata arctica studio album uh that's more or less just a thought at the moment i have few songs like frames of a song like cornerstones of the album ready there but if everything goes well and we get to actually tour then we at the moment aim at hitting the studio like early 2023 and and then if all things go well, you might be actually able to listen to the next Sonata Arctic album in 2023, late of the year. Hey, uh, one last thing about Acoustic Adventures. It has no wolf on the cover. That's very unusual. There are just two acoustic guitars crossed over, like two rifles or something, uh, but no wolf. Yeah. Uh, were you? Did you consciously keep the wolf out or was just something that after it was made, you were, oh shit, no wolf? It didn't feel like a wolf. Maybe. I don't know. Someone someone came up with the idea and I just went with it. And a wolf would have been okay. I, I would have been totally content <laughs> having a wolf there because it, it not only is it is our sort of totem animal and our logo almost, it also, when you are designing merchandise, it sort of works really, really well. When a musician tries to make or rearrange their music into something more acoustic. I remember watching a few documentaries some years ago of different bands when they were preparing to the uh, MTV Unplugged, for example, uh, which is even a, which is of course not rearranging, but just even just trying to play a fast song in in in, in an acoustic medium can be very difficult. Were there songs that from your own discography that you wanted perhaps to rearrange into something acoustic, but that you realize this is just not working out? <laughs> I think we have one of those songs on the first, the volume one here, Wolf and Raven. We should have actually <laughs> thought of that a little bit because the, the main riff, the tiddly lily thing there, it, it, it's near nearly impossible to play with piano. At least that was Henka. Henka told me <laughs> it's pain in the ass with the acoustic instruments to, to, to make it sound good. 
it's so funny because when I looked at the YouTube, uh, somebody uploaded it, uh, the, the, the acoustic adventures from last year, one of the first thing I did was to check, is there Wolf and Raven here? Because I can't imagine that's going to sound okay. <laughs> um, so, okay, so that one was, at the very least, you think maybe that one didn't work out so well? Mm, I, I, maybe I will. <laughs> that will reserve judgment for the fans. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 sort of, yeah. I, I didn't have much to do with that song. The guys really wanted to have it there and... Uh, of course, you know, obviously on the, the remastering of Silence, I was asked to do this like bonus version of some some of the songs. And I, I made this really, to put it mildly, an artistic version of, of Wolf and Raven, which is there. And, and that was me alone and, and me and just, you know, instruments and no other musicians there. So it, it, it was different, but it was a little bit too different to put it on, on the acoustic album. But we should have thought some bits and pieces and and maybe instead of making it this ready fast song it, it would have been better to find an alternative road to get it out because we have done a lot of rearranging and rewriting on, on the other songs partially and, and 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 i think wolf and raven would have deserved to be treated a little bit differently it's, it's by no means it's my favorite song to start with but but, but just still. in general wolf and raven yeah, it's it's one of those songs that are definitely one of the most well-known Sonatarctica songs within certain demographic and certain group of fans, the power metal fans. They, a lot of them mention Wolf and Raven probably first. So, yeah, it, maybe we should have and could have thought of it a little bit differently. But when, when we go back on road, we have a chance of changing it a little bit and not necessarily trying to do what we do on the album now. This is not about getting bored with the song. I'm definitely not bored. We have not played Wolf and Raven live that much to get bored with it. I, I should be much more bored with Don't Say a Word or Full Moon, for that matter. But but they are still fun songs to do. I love doing those live because they, they resonate with the audience and, and they get to sing along and everything. But Wolf and Raven, as a default, I should have a serious talk with the dude who wrote the song. <laughs> myself <laughs> because i did not compose myself a lot of room for breathing for one and it was a little bit too intensive for me as a singer to perform maybe some singers can do it much better than i can for sure it's just like it doesn't allow me any any singing it's uh, basically almost screaming if you ask me but just pain in the ass to do live and, and that's that's the main reason because i i I love when I'm able to perform the songs that I have written and we have recorded as Sonatarctica, when I'm able to do those also live and give the best version of them also to the people in a live situation. And I, and, and I was never able to do that with Wolf and Raven, and I'm not afraid to say that at this age anymore. <laughs> it's it's just, a, just a, like impossible song for me to really, really do credit for oh yeah but you're not the only musician i think who, who faces that challenge that they create a song that works perfectly well in studio but if you actually try to do that live the the, the kind of uh exhaustion that you bring into the musicians uh can be just impossible to to the thing uh, is that you know we were young and i didn't know my limits that's that's like the ma major thing here i didn't know what i was doing and of course you know after when we were playing that song live, it was also a learning experience. I think a lot of the band, I think Tommy as well, he was on, on, on the limit and, and of, of his capabilities at that time with that song. You know, it's, it's, it's so, so intensive. So, you know, when you max out every, every capacity that the band has, that's what you get. A song that sounds really, really good in studio and you can perform it in studio, but, but then when it, happens live and you realize that you have like 12 to 15 songs more to do besides just that one song so it's 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 too much i am sure that every musician who writes something when they are that young they they can't imagine themselves ever losing the skill that they have so at that time you can do good falsettos you can you have a breathing that you're probably not going to have at 45 50 60 etc so when did you start to to realize I'm actually human, and uh, this might not be a good idea for, for concerts. To a certain extent, I think really at, uh, in the beginning of our career, or I think like around Winterheart Guild, 
or Reckoning Night, the latest, started having different kind of songs, but I wasn't smart enough. <laughs> I started just making dif- different kind of mistakes and, and, and you know, adding 100,000 different layers of vocals in one song, which does not really help at all. <laughs> in the same situation, it doesn't, doesn't serve the purpose. I, I think some years ago, I, I noticed that it, when you get over 40, you start, start start noticing that you are not recovering from certain things that you do as quickly and your voice is changing and, and, and it's not not going to be the same as you were when you were younger. You don't sound like that kid anymore. And you, I think rather than, you know, being scared or spooked by that thing and then be distressed by it, you know, you should embrace it and let time bring you the best that it has to give and, and give that depth that, that it's bringing to your voice and use it the right way. And maybe, you know, not, not do those impossible songs. You don't have to do those, you know, there are younger kids and it's, it's a young man's game, I think, doing songs like Wolf and Raven in the way that it is in the album there. We can still do it, but it, it's bound to be a little bit different from, from Silence album version from 2001. When, when you see yourself as a musician and you start to face the fact that, as you mentioned now, uh, some of the things that you are writing have become more difficult, does that make you think maybe this has an end date in the sense that I will I will do the best that I can until I am, I don't know, 60, 65 or whatever? Or do you think, well, this isn't really going to be a challenge because I am not, I'm also not a 20 year old kid anymore. So I am creating songs that work with who I am. Uh, because I think that I, I noticed both of these uh, challenges. I recently had it when I listened to the latest album by Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden are, I think, my, my favorite band. I follow them for now. <laughs> because I'm old the majority of my life. Uh, and um, and one of the things that I uh, noticed there in the latest album that I did live in Mexico was that you can see that Bruce Dickinson's uh, voice is no longer able to function the way the songs were originally written. So you have to do what maybe Judas Priest does, which is to downtune the music so that he can actually work with that. And, and the dude is a, a cancer survivor, so it is throat cancer survivor, so it is... Uh, it is miraculous he's even singing it at all. Um, so so I, I don't mean to kind of disrespect the person that I consider to be an, an amazing singer, but but I guess that, that challenge exists that you think, well, no, 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 this is the music that I make and I have to continue singing it. Or to take the attitude that you clearly are demonstrated, which you have demonstrated, I'm sorry, in your previous answer, which is to say, well, that's a young man's game. I have to basically work with the tools that I have. Yeah, basically that's it. You know, of course, this acoustic album it, it goes in that direction we can we can of course you know lower the key and, and, and rearrange and approach the original song versions a little bit differently and, and make it possible for us to to keep it keep it going and continue and, and i've actually consciously started uh, writing songs in a little bit lower key and and taking a more mature approach to it because it's it's fun to be able to sing the songs at least in studio <laughs> so that's one thing but also you know this acoustic uh, project it's it's of course paving the road into that direction i i would imagine that we are able to do some form of acoustic songs even when we are 75 it's it's not that physically demanding so but, but that's definitely of course we are still young <laughs> relatively young so that's that's not our aim but that's of course one thing that is enabling it and i enjoy having this acoustic career this acoustic form of sonata arctica running parallel and alongside the normal sonata arctica i think it's, it's a really enriching experience for both the band and and the fan base and everybody i'm very fascinated by the biology or anatomy of of, of, of the process of, of singing because i i don't think up until the last few years i i don't think i had fully realized how exhausting singing is for a performer uh and um and how it is not merely a thing of oh i'm just gonna be drinking beer and smoking up until 30 minutes before the show and then everything will be okay but instead you actually have to take a lot of care of your voice and of your body because that is the instrument that you are using of course you need to listen to your body and and react whatever changes you notice that if if you start 
start having tensions in an, in a region that that's directly in connection with with your singing abilities say like throat tension for whatever you need to deal with that and you need to take care of it and, and get rid of it or tongue ten- tension which i was suffering actually for a long long time until i realized what it especially when you're singing high you need to use your tongue in a certain way and if it gets tension it, it gets really really difficult google it there are a lot of stuff about that tongue tension so it makes singing really difficult and so you need to attend any and all all problems you have and an in touring environment it's for a singer generally speaking even for young singers oh but you want to party and everything but you should take care of rest what brought you to heavy metal i know that you were brought to 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 music or to perhaps this type of singing because you really like a queen but heavy metal and in particular the type of heavy metal that you were creating in albums like ecliptica successor and silence it's a very specific type of music that obviously at the time was reminiscent of stuff like stratovarius etc um what brought you to this uh, genre of ours stratovarius simple as that it was only only stratovarius i i never really was into any other band power metal band that much as i, I was into stratovarius back in the day that that was like the biggest thing for me and funniest thing episode album when i heard it for the first time some songs of it i almost puked i thought it was like most oh, oh, horrendous shit i have ever heard in my life and i it was our ex bass players cd and i i was just about to toss it up out, out of the window of the car <laughs> because I, I, I don't want to listen to this kind of crap but then I don't know what happened but I heard their visions album a few songs like the first singles played on radio and TV and it started to intrigue me a lot and then I bought the album and I completely utterly fell in love with that and it, it was just like the biggest thing for me and I could not believe that they are actually a Finnish band and and uh, I was all about Stradivarius then, and, and obviously it, it translated into my own music really quickly. And I had to ask and force Tommy to start playing double kicks so we can cover Stradivarius and, and get into that stuff ourselves. So yeah, that that's how, how easy that was. Uh, I, I went to Oulu, which is like 100 kilometers south from where I live, and, and they were playing their visitors tour. I was a big fanboy, so I, I, I stayed there after the, the show and, and, and meet everybody, and, and, and I got signatures, and I even got Jörg's drumstick and everything, so it was perfect. Uh, and, uh, you, never, you never forget these experiences. I was in the front row and had my camera. And, and and Timo, first of all, Kotipelto, he took my camera and took some photos and then he gave it to Jens and he also took some photos and I, I got my camera back and I was like, oh my God, this is the best day ever. <laughs> that, that, of course, that was the final seal for my fandom of Stradivarius, that they are really cool guys and that was the best experience of my life. God damn, yeah. That's such a great story. Thank you so much for sharing it. Uh, that's yeah. that's cute because yeah, I, it... I owe them a lot, yeah. You can imagine what it was like when we actually got to tour with them, the first ever European tour, and it was with those guys. Like, what the fuck? How was that? How, how was, because you're describing yourself as this massive fan. You know, you're completely blown away. You're, you know, the best day of your life. You know, they take your camera, they take photos. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And, you know, fast forward a few years later, you're touring with them. This is success for you. Uh, how, how was that? It was numbing, you know, I was totally like, oh my God, this is, this is a scared shitless <laughs> to go on tour. And then and, and first thing that we heard that we we're going to share a bus with Rhapsody. <laughs> and when, when we uh, saw um, the picture of the guys and, and some of us actually knew uh, Rhapsody already, but, but, you know, when we saw the, we were pretty sure that they're all using drugs and they're like awful criminals the whole bunch <laughs> and they they saw the picture that we have on our on the cover of the ecliptica where we have like all these dark eyes <laughs> and everything they thought that we are the same so it was fun when we were sharing the stories that we we were b- both really scared going on the same bus with, <laughs> with that other band and and then they were just the funniest guys and it was like the best tour ever basically and the great start and and Stradivarius treated us like that was like the best treatment that you can get from a band and that is something that we have carried on to bands that we are touring with that, that, and, and trying to treat the 
uh, bands that are supporting us as as well as possible, and then trying to pay this kind of service forward. Because there is the flip side of the coin, and and some bands just treat their supports really like complete crap. And I I can't see how that serves the purpose of the tour being a success. Such freedom, I I think it comes with responsibility. So the band, the, the support band must also act accordingly, you know, because, you know, it, it's it's such good treatment is not free, obviously, you know, it, it, you need to accept, you know, earn it. Yeah, yeah be, be a decent and not bounce around too much and behave. We are not asking much, just, you know, normal, decent behavior. I think it must be difficult also when you're a young band opening for somebody else, because that, op- the, the pers- that band that you're opening for, they've done this before. Uh, this might be one of your first ones, and there has to be some part of you that wants to get to live, even if just a little bit, the rock star experience. I mean, uh, at least a little bit. You you want to get to 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 have uh, maybe fifteen motley crew minutes in your life. <laughs> yeah, everybody wants to have that, but you know it, and it's fun. It's it's nice to see young kids, and and it, it's sort of part of the whole rock and roll experience. And being in a band, you need to have that and then do it sometime. But it some somewhere along, like when you get 35 or whatever, it starts to be a little bit pathetic. If you are crawling on totally drunk on the floor and, and it, it starts, it's not funny anymore. And it looks really, really bad. <laughs> so, so that's young man's game. It becomes pathetic really quickly. Since it's December, I forgot to ask you this. Are you still involved in uh, Raskasta Yola? Yes, I am. Unfortunately, I fell ill. I've been having cold for uh, like two weeks now on and off. So I, I had to skip the first show that we had. Almost the home show that we had like in Oulu, 100 kilometers south. So I was unable to attend. But, you know, I hope to go this Friday. We're starting a three-show stint in, in southern Finland. So I'm looking forward to going there. A few years ago, when we talked about the the ninth hour, you mentioned something that then when I edited the interview, I looked it up, which was you singing with the Oulu Symphony Orchestra. You were singing uh, Tango Bolero. Um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because you mentioned that you really enjoyed that type of uh, different things. And uh, I am curious as to whether you are still planning to uh, to do that type of different things with your music. So completely separate, in other words, from Sonata Artica in the same way that you did uh, Rasca Stajola, uh, if you're also going to do other independent things where you get to play with your voice in non-metal ways. Every opportunity I get, I, I, I consider at least if I have a chance or if this is something that I would, I would like to do. Every now and again, and you get an offer from somebody that would be would you be interested in such a thing? I'm not sure if you have heard of this Sonata uh, 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 Symphonica thing that we had some years back. So that was great, you know, actually having a symphony orchestra and me. The band was not involved in it per se. It's just, you know, songs, symphony orchestra and me doing the singing. And, and, and that was wonderful. And I would love to do that more. And, and, you know, we were actually even talking that would it be financially viable to do that, it would be great to go abroad and take this thing on the road. But you know, <laughs> that's a, that's a big order and big dream <laughs> to to have filled. Atomic yeah. Fire is a new label. Maybe you can convince them to to put some money and invest in Sonata Artica's uh, <laughs> symphonic tour. Maybe just maybe. as a way to establish <laughs> the brand. Tony, thank you so much uh, for your time. I really appreciate it. it. Has been a great pleasure to speak with you. Man. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. 